Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our first panel, The Competitive Landscape, Prospects for Growth in 2017 and Beyond. Our moderator, Glenn Yunkin, President and Chief Operating Officer of the Carlisle Group. He's joined by Jim Clifton, Chairman and CEO, Gallup, Jack Leslie, Chairman, Weber Sandwick, the Honorable Terry McAuliffe, Governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia, and Dr. Jonathan Wetzel, Director and Senior Partner, McKinsey Global Institute, Shanghai. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Glenn Yunkin, and uh, I'm the president at the Carlisle Group. And I have the pleasure of trying to um, orchestrate and control this incredibly talented collection of folks. Um, we're going to try to cover a fair amount of ground this morning, uh, all the way from the global economic picture to what last night's events uh, in Syria mean, uh, what's gonna happen in Florida, uh, what uh, the pending tax legislation could mean, um, how governors work with businesses in order to promote trade. Um, so governor, I'm just giving you advance warning. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so we're just gonna, we're gonna get moving. I'm, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on everyone's biography. I have to say, if I did, we might take up the whole hour. Um, it's just an incredibly talented group of folks, and thank you all for being here. I want to start with the global economy, but I'm going to start in the United States first. And uh, what I'd love to know, Jim, is are we in a recovery? I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, but I'll tell you, Glenn, I, I got interested in this. I, I got on a plane. You all do this where you, where, where you get on and you, um, they bring the newspapers by on your long flight overseas, and I had the Financial Times, the International New York Times, I, I got an Economist magazine, and, and whatever else. But so you sort of had the left and the right there. On the front page of every one of them, I read that America's uh, in a recovery. But I stared at that, because apparently we, everybody agrees, that's something that doesn't divide us, but it's a pretty important word. I actually looked it up because I was thinking maybe I don't know what recovery means. It means that you've been sick and you're getting well. I, I, bet, I bet most of you know that. So I went to our economist uh, group. I took our top guys, said, call around the Nobel Prize winners, everything else. I want to get agreement on this. And they said, well, the best thing you use is productivity. I, I didn't know what productivity was. I just wanted to get that off my chest. Now you can go on to the next. <laughs> um, but what they said is that when left and right leaning economists argue, they all agree that we're going to use the same definition. The definition is GDP um, divided is per capita, divided by the number of people. So if you say what's GDP right now, it's since the recession, it's about 2%. If you do a little linear regression, it's drifting down. So it's increasing at a decreasing rate. But what really is dramatic is when, see, if you have 2% growth, uh, let's say eight years ago, and 2% now, what you got to count is we were 300 million people back then, now we're 330. So if you divide it, here's what it looks like over, over 20 years. So it's not really a president. There's a bigger force on this. It, if I had a graph, it would look just like this. But we're definitely not in recovery. Interesting. Jonathan, McKinsey Global Institute studies this kind of topic, left, right, inside out. You, know, you have resources and access to clients around the world. Uh, what are you guys saying right now? Uh, as I was saying, it's like, a lot depends on where you sit. I, I sit in Shanghai, and so I see growth. I, I see cities. Um, I see technology. Uh, see a fair bit of exports. <laughs> um, I see a lot more imports, actually, now than I was. I see three billion consumers who didn't have consumption you know, a decade or two ago, where they're not just China, of course, it's India, it's Middle East, it's Africa. My work is largely around cities, and so I kind of see all of that. I spend about 25% of my time uh, here in the US. And again, I see growth, I see recovery, um, but 
it's patchy. There are places which are doing great at participating in all of that new consumption. Uh, they're exporting or they're digitizing or they're uh, creating new kinds of knowledge and products that are unique and, and really innovative for export, but also right here. So uh, I kind of think, you know, our global view is, as I said, yeah, I mean, one, two percent growth, it happens. Uh, but what's really questioning, you have to look at those like, where is that growth coming from? And what's sustainable about it? That's the productivity conversation. So if the growth is all just about, let's leverage up, let's borrow a little bit more, and we can grow. Well, we've seen that picture before. Yeah. Uh, and that's the concern that we have about this recovery. Is where is the productivity? Where is the smarter growth coming from? And who's doing it? Great. I'm not going to step over you, Jack, but I am for a minute. Governor, when you look at the Commonwealth of Virginia in this context of how's the United States doing, when you look at the Commonwealth, how's the Commonwealth's economy doing as a microcosm for the country? Well, listen, our whole key, when I got elected three years ago, my whole mission was what I call build the new Virginia economy. You know, Virginia is the number one recipient of Department of Defense dollars. We have more military installations than any state in America, the largest naval base in the world, the Pentagon, CIA. That's all great news when they're spending money, but when you get sequestration, as we had in 11 through 13, Virginia lost $9.8 billion direct spending, lost 154,000 jobs. So my whole emphasis has been about diversifying, growing the economy in new areas. I'm very proud we now have more cyber companies than any state in America. Data analytics, human genome sequencing. I just announced a new project with the Nova Hospital for a billion dollars. And it's working. Uh, as I say, we have grown tremendously. When I took office, our unemployment was 5.4. I just announced 3.9 the other day. Our unemployment claims have just reached a 44-year low, lowest since 1973. <clears throat> About 16.5 billion of new capital. We brought in 902 projects. So I can tell you from Virginia, we now have the second lowest unemployment of any major state in America. We were in bad shape, we have now diversified, and it's a global economy. Um, I'm also proud I'm the most traveled governor in America. I will go to Mexico uh, in two weeks for my 24th trade mission. I've been to dozens of countries. 95% of the world's customers live outside of America. I did 35 billion in trade last year, so I am constantly going to these countries to, to open up trade relations and sell ag products and, and services. So we're doing great. I mean, 200,000 new jobs since I've been in office. I mean, we're a new state today only because we diversified. And unfortunately, we're going to have another continuing resolution this year, which means sequestration level cuts for America are going to stay. It is a disgrace that the Congress cannot get a budget passed uh, and that we're operating under these continuing resolutions. It is a real di disservice to the American public. So here we have one out of 50 states that's doing very well and has uh, really shown great strides. Jack, you advise, and your firm advise, but maybe you do personally, 35 of the 50 Fortune 50 companies. And when they look at the economic situation, and we're still just focused on the US, what do you hear from them? Well, I think, you know, to, to Jonathan's point, it's, uh, it depends on where you sit. I think most of them see perhaps two different economies. Um, we're, uh, both our industry and many of our clients have got fairly robust growth right now. We're gonna see this quarter, what, 9% earnings that we haven't seen in quite some time is the product projection. So a good part of the economy, at least when you're talking to the Fortune 50, actually seems fairly robust. What there is, though, is a mismatch of skills. They're, they're, my business is a good example. Digitization, which is obviously such a big part of this growth has hit our business tremendously. If you're in the newspaper business, you probably know that. 70% of our growth in the last two or three years has been from digital. We're high, we can't hire enough millennials yeah. to go and manage social media for our clients. We can't find them. Yeah. Um, but when we're not hiring, unfortunately, and if any of you are out there are former journalists, you know, we're not hiring the former journalists to come in. Uh, so it's a great example of what's happened with sort of an old economy and a new economy where we really do have this growth, but we have this, this mismatch in skills. And I think that's what's leading to, to the angst in the country, and that's what leads to the populism, because people don't, don't believe they, they have opportunity. Yeah. So um, I, I just want to shift to meetings in Florida 
um, and China. Um, uh, you know, the Chinese economy, the Chinese imports into the United States um, have probably been one of the most talked about topics over the last year during the political debates. Um, and there's two things resting on that. One, how's China doing from an economic standpoint? And two, um, how are we competing from a trade standpoint? And so Jonathan, if you wouldn't mind, just, just give us a quick update on or your, your perspectives on how China's doing economically. Well, it's going through this big transition. I think uh, kind of everybody knows what a modern economy is supposed to look like. It's supposed to look like it's got cities, it's got services, it's productivity, it's all about consumers. Well, basically China's kind of none of that. Uh, China's all sort of coming from the countryside, lots of factories, lots of investment, lots of industry, and so it's kind of this from to. And it's somewhere between that old model and what a modern economy should look like. And yeah, it's an economy with a whole lot of state influence. It's a state-led process and a very sort of uh, administratively governed kind of process. So in that context, you know, if you do the basic things right, and it's almost impossible to mess it up. <laughs> I mean, be, you know, you save 40%, invest 40%, you're gonna get five, six, 7% growth. It's just math. <laughs> and you know, that, the, the, so it's in really very hard to come up with any kind of scenario where China implodes. Now, China can have a slowdown. And so for China, a slowdown is going from double digit, 10% annual growth for two decades, which very few countries ever managed to do, to where it is now. 6% growth, five or six, and that's kind of where it is. It's at the five, six, and people will argue, is it six, is it five? I don't know, it's probably closer to five than it is to six. There's a lot of financialization going on, there's a lot of sort of leverage creeping in, there's just too much credit supply, too much money going floating around there, just walls of cash. And I think if you look at real estate purchases across North America, you can see a lot of that cash. <laughs> it's creeping into shopping malls, into residential purchases. You look at downtown LA, there are five skyscrapers going up, which are totally, which were stalled for a decade, uh, and they're totally pre-sold in Shanghai. <laughs> uh, so you know, there, there is a, a large amount of money floating out there that may or may not going to the right places. So yeah, that's the one. That's the one. So overall, a big economy, growing a bit slower than it did before, somewhere in this transition. Now, the bigger question, I think, and where it's on the, the table is this, so how do you play? And is it a fair game? And you know, are we getting access to this next wave? And particularly with uh, what they put out was made in China, 2025, 2030, the, the sort of new industrial plan, which for the first time said, we aspire for Chinese products to have this kind of market share in these types of industries. And so, whoa, you know, people stepping back and the chambers come out with a, of a bunch of this and the Europeans same, saying, you know, that's, that's clearly targeting and you're actually sort of reserving uh, in set, sets of industries. That's, I think, what's on the conversation right now. Right. It's like, what do you mean by a domestic product? I mean, for example, if I build my factory in China, is that a domestic factory? So that's right. my question. Governor, <laughs> um, the, the Virginia Economic Development Partnership, which is, the, the real foundation of all your trade missions. Have you been to China and when, you know, is China really some place that small and medium sized businesses in, in the United States and in the Commonwealth could aspire to export to? No question. I will be going on my fifth trade mission to China since yeah. I've been governor in three years. Um, last year we were able to announce the largest investment ever done by a Chinese company. Uh, we won that in Virginia, a $2 billion investment, 2,000 new jobs. Uh, Trandall and Paper Company. That was a very competitive, 30 states, we won it. Um, in addition, five years ago, we had a huge soybean. We sold a billion dollars worth of soybeans. So we have leaned in. I have an office in uh, Beijing. We just opened up an office in Shanghai. Yeah. So we're investing our dollars. I you know, also serve as chairman of the national governors. I always give the pitch to my fellow governors. I mean, you have to go to these countries. It's one thing to send a trade delegation. But when a governor from a state goes, you're going to guaranteed to meet the leadership. It really helps open up doors. So I encourage my fellow governors, there's so much business in China to do. They are investing here. And I want every penny of investment I can get. Huge opportunity for us. Vietnam is opening up dramatically for us. So, you know, we've really in Virginia put a huge market down in the Asia markets. That's great. So the, the concept of there being, and I, I understand the group yesterday talked about um, free and fair trade with China um, isn't one that is un, 
uh, unbelievable. Right? The, the states can win, companies can win. Um, and yet there's a little bit of a view that what might happen is we end up in a bit of a trade war. Jim, when we look at what's gonna happen in negotiations and discussions in, in Florida this weekend, um, how do you think it's gonna, it's gonna represent America's views on trade? You know, it's amazing uh, to me, and, and I don't know what it is, but it must be social media, but our conversations and conventional wisdom gets really off. Um, I don't know how many of you did this. I told all my clients that Donald Trump can't win mathematically, which wasn't real helpful for my credibility, but I know a lot of you have walked a mile in my, mile in my moccasins. But right now there's a feeling, the conventional wisdom is that America is drawing back, that we don't want foreign trade. I just checked, because you and I were sitting in the green room, and asked, this morning when you say to Americans you think foreign trade is good or bad for economic growth, what percent of Americans do you think say is good? Just get a number in your mind. It's the highest it's been in 10 years, it's 72%. I'll bet you anything Trump and his team are thinking that that number's 18 or 25%. Another real fooler uh, to me, Glenn, I just looked this up you, uh, when you were asking me those questions, but if you ask about NAFTA, it's been running at around 35 to 38%. Favorability, same question, is it good or bad? And this morning it's at 48% good which is very, very high because you have a huge don't know. Americans don't know what's, what NAFTA is, but NAFTA itself. And so the conventional, what citizens are actually thinking about, what's gonna happen with China and all of that, I, 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 I think that Trump and his team have their assumptions and premises wrong. That's what I think. Well, I think too, the, you know, when you look at the campaign rhetoric, it was really around currency manipulation and, and the deficit. The currency manipulation issue is kind of gone. Um, and you know, Not 100% clear why it's gone, but it's but gone. It's, it's, not, it's <laughs> not like it was during the campaign. And, you, and, and you know, we can all reduce the deficit by just reducing trade on both sides. Uh, and I think, I think it's going to become apparent on them as they go through these issues in, in Florida that, uh, that it's in both interests side to somehow create a, a trade framework. But there had to be... You know, when TPP went down, there had to be a lot of celebrations, in, I think, in Beijing. I mean, that was a big, it's now a big opportunity for them. Can I say one more? Yeah. The, it, I think it would be a really good time for the president to educate. When you ask Americans about size of economies, most Americans think China's economy is way bigger than ours. I just learned that, too. But you see, so they're wondering about, oh, my gosh, here they're down talking with China. He's got to win because China's overtaking us. But it would be a good time for him to explain that our economy is much bigger and get some kind of truth in there, but, but I think presidents need to educate too, but, um, but I think it'd be a real good time to, to clear that up. Well, let me just put TP in yeah. perspective for Virginia. You know, I was a strong advocate. We had a bipartisan group of governors, Terry Branstad and I, governor of Iowa, was going to be our new ambassador to China. This rhetoric around the campaign is not helpful to us who have to trade every single day. But those TPP countries, 62% of my exports went to those countries. So what happens now? China now goes in, we're out of the game. I would love an agreement where I have one agreement with all these countries, instead of doing one-off agreements, which time consuming, we can't do that as governors. So what happens now is China moves in and they'll do an agreement with these countries. And we will be the odd man out here in America. You give me a fair trade deal, protect worker rights, protect the environment, I will take on anybody and compete with anybody around the globe. This idea that America cannot compete on a global basis is just plain wrong. And for those of us as governors, we, our main job is to create jobs. You know, we're not senators or congressmen. We don't have filibusters. And we have to balance budgets every year. I have to create jobs. Trade, international trade, is such an integral fabric to doing that. And I do worry the rhetoric that did come out in the campaign that you know, we got to make America competitive. We can beat anybody, but we got to be in the game, and we got to get off of this anti-trade rhetoric that's going on in the country. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting, Governor, because we, we find ourselves in this debate between the economists and I think the business people doers. And I think the, the basic sentiment of if we can sell more and grow our revenue line, we're gonna to have to hire more people in order to manufacture it. 
um, has to be a practicality that people recognize, um, that selling more is yeah. a good thing. <clears throat> it's just flat a good thing. And I'm not sure based on, I'm you know, just a simple business guy, but I'm not sure that there's any disagreement on that. It's just a matter of how to get there. Um, so let's flip, let, let's move to Europe quickly. Um, uh, are you advising your clients to rush into the UK and start striking deals or sit and we're wait not, as we're Brexit not plays our out? We're clients right now to rush in anywhere. Anywhere. <laughs> to tell you the truth. And I mean, that's a big part of the problem. I'm not so sure that our problem is uh, economic as much as it is political. I mean, you just, it's very hard to envision long term growth with the kind of dysfunction that we're seeing, and not just in the United States, but, but we're now that we've gone over to Europe, um, in Europe as well. I mean, Brexit really is uh, creating uh, a lot of, of, of uncertainty, and business doesn't like uncertainty. If you've got to make longer term investment decisions and you don't know what the trade rules are going to be, you don't know whether you're going to have access to EU markets in five years' time, how are you going to make, how are you going to make those kinds of decisions? So right now we're finding with our clients is that there's a pullback, there's a pause. Um, I think there's probably a little less panic over Brexit than there was, but clearly the, uh, the UK is going to pay a price. They're either going to pay it in, in, in freedom of, of immigration or they're paying, going to pay in hard cash somewhere. They're not going to get off the hook uh, on this. And uh, we'll see what happens. I think in the last few weeks, my own folks have been a little bit more positive. Um, Merkel seems to be much stronger in, in Germany. The French elections may not turn out to be the big disaster that everyone was worried about, although I also predicted you know, that Trump could never win, so we'll see what happens with Le Pen. I don't believe the polls anymore, I guess. <laughs> uh, so I, I do, I, there seems to be, I mean, actually, from our, our business is somewhat cyclical. Our business is pretty good in Europe. I've been surprised at how robust it's been, um, both, both in the UK and on the continent. Yeah, we're, we're, we're seeing in our own global portfolio that the European portfolio has shown particular strength um, yeah. and growth. It's yeah. interesting, a lot of the growth is driven by exports. Um, yes. And you know, of course, the European Union has a much larger share, particularly of the emerging market recipients of exports than the United States does today. Um, and so there's a real opportunity there. And I think the discussion around what's gonna happen in the French elections, and of course the Germans are watching very closely yeah. um, well, I think will have a monumental impact on the future of the European Union. Um, so um, so that, that brings us back to the overnight events. Well, we just continue to circle the globe and um, the Middle East particularly, always an easy topic to talk about. Um, do, do you actually see the developments overnight and clearly the administration's action in Syria and um, now reaction from Russia of changing some of the um, general views of the administration's ability to take on Russia? But, Easy question, Jim. Yeah, I was gonna say, um, I don't think there's any question that, that his, uh, I, I would think that his uh, approval ratings will bounce at least 10 points in the next 48 hours. You know, events are funny, this is kind of off subject, but when an event happens, it doesn't really get talked into the uh, citizens for two to three days. Sometimes it takes, depending upon the event, sometimes it takes a whole week. It, it doesn't go in as fast, even with social media and, and um, all of that. When we ask the public, uh, do you want to get involved in war? They say, no, 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 no more wars. But this is where, however, you, have, you can get it to come out any way you want. But if you say, do you think it'd be good to make precision strikes to stop um, uh, aside from killing uh, children and babies, then, then we're 100% in. I was watching MSNBC and CNN last, um, I was watching them all because I was getting, you know, there's pretty good agreement on this. I was really surprised at how the far left leaning uh, people on MSNBC and CNN were saying this was the right thing to do. It also fixes the red line problem before. They're very specific. Now, if it was coming off of Fox, then you wouldn't, you go, well, that, that's obviously political. It means more when it's coming from the left saying, we really needed this and that. So I, I don't know how, I, this is kind of cynical, I don't know how long he'll hold it, hold the positive, but I think it's a, I don't think there's any question it's a big positive uh, for as long as he can hold it. Yeah, I think, you know, um, it was Colin Powell who said before we went into Iraq, if you break it, you own it. Um, so I think he's now, you know, he owns it much more certainly than he did 24 hours ago. 
we'll see how that works. I, I, but I, I'm, we're representing some folks in that region, and um, I'm actually more optimistic on, on their ability to, uh, and I know this sounds like a big statement, but for their ability to effectuate some kind of a settlement, Palestinian settlement. They are lining up um, Egypt, the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Jordanians, they're, many of them are now much closer to Israel um, against, the, against the Syrians and, and Iran, and that seems to be the, all of a sudden there's a different kind of dynamic, um, and we'll see whether Jared Kushner is able to pull it, pull it off. If I could yeah, yeah. just pitch in on that a little bit, I do so spend a fair bit of my time in the region. The, uh, I think it's, first of all, um, a mistake to sort of focus on the, uh, you know, the guns and bullets parts of this. And that if we actually look at what's going on in the Middle East, it's uh, again, this move to a, a new economy, a new society and urbanization, industrialization, all that. That's kind of where all these guys are really focused because they have a demographic time bomb. You've got 40% of most of these countries age under 25. You've got an oil price of 30 bucks. You know, all those two numbers will just tell you that you've got to, have a, you've got to fix the economy and you've got to build, start building and industrializing and, and putting technology in place. So all the rest of it is basically about how do I get enough breathing room to do that? And the thing I come back to is like Jack Ma saying, you know, the United States took this huge bounty of, of, uh, of its economy and all this productivity and spent it on guns and bullets. Uh, and so you know, the message being, let's, not, let's do that, yes, but I think people are still saying, and will the U.S., can, you know, return, invest, develop, trade uh, with the region in a way which is competitive, is competitive with the Chinese who are, of course, following that, that, that playbook right now in the region. So I, I kind of think of the place in the region as actually, as you say, kind of, it's one of the more optimistic parts of the world that I go to, as people are actually really focused on, okay, let's get the job done. Let's you know, start, let's start building new, new stuff and new economies and new companies. But, so for the U.S., it's like, okay, Get, in, get, into the, get into the playbook and, and start being part of this. Right. Well, while we're there, so the, the, the 2030 plan from the Deputy Crown Prince in Saudi Arabia just it seems incredibly ambitious, but also necessary. What, what's your uh, assessment of the likelihood of him being successful? Well, I think it's a vision statement. <laughs> so you know, that's sort of where we want to go. And, and, and I, to do that, so, you know, this is a country and a region where you know, it, the private sector almost doesn't play a role at this state. And it's again, an extremely government-led. And, and you have a vast skills gap across the entire economy, all of these, and plus the migration sort of challenge, basically two. So a lot of issues, a lot of reasons I can say why this would be impossible. But you know, that's not the point. <laughs> the point is just that this Babe Ruth saying, OK, over there. OK, fine. Yeah. Do you really expect him to hit the home run? No. If he does, great. But he's going to take a swing, and he's going to go for it. And that's what the guy's doing. He's taking a swing, and he's going to go for it. And he's looking for his team. So who's on my team? Uh, that's, that's the call now. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Governor, I'm going to come back to, to the, uh, the, the role you've played in developing uh, Virginia's economy. Um, and I just want to kind of head off and have a little bit of a, a practice session with you. So how do you do it? You know, here you sit as a governor, and you've got a state that has gone through some economic turmoil. How do you plan where to go? How do you pick the companies you're working with and the sectors? Well, <clears throat> I always say the key to economic development is your workforce. Um, we've been very successful. I mean, just last week I announced that we were able to move uh, Nestle Corporation uh, out of California. They just moved to Northern Virginia for their headquarters. $240 billion a year in annual sales. It was, it was a great win for us. Uh, and I sat with the chairman when I was out pitching the deal several months ago, and we finally got to an agreement. And I said, with all the factors that we did of why I come to Virginia, what was the one thing that made the difference for you? He said, education. So I, I go back to, with workforce, you've got to have a great education system. Last year, I put a billion dollars of new money into education in Virginia to redesign our high schools. You know, high schools in America don't work anymore. They're big buildings with classroom, with seats. You get credit for seat time. I have 36,000 cyber jobs open in Virginia today, starting pay $88,000. We've got to transform our education system so that our students are getting the skills to match the jobs that exist. I have the second most number of technology uh, workers of any state in America, but I, I need to double that. So how do you do it? You build your education, you show businesses you're willing to invest in workforce. 
in, in working with our, my legislature. I have a very Republican legislature, but I got 90% of what I want done working a bipartisan way. You know, if you want to get a cyber degree in Virginia and you'll come work for the state for two years, I'll pay for your education. If you're a veteran, I will pay for you to go get a cyber degree. So we are leaning in uh, on all these big issues. So, you're, you know, I love to sell. I go all over the globe. I enjoy doing this. But no business is going to move to a state in America or around in a state unless they know they're going to have a workforce for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. That goes to education. And last week, uh, the top journal on education just said Virginia is the number one higher education system in America. That really helps do it. We can recruit businesses in. That's fabulous. Um, it, it, these, these cyber security jobs, these high paying jobs, these good jobs, Jim, um, you all have done a tremendous amount of work in trying to quantify the flow of the workforce between high paying jobs and maybe not so high paying jobs and really what's underpinning some of the unemployment data. What observations do you have right now? Um. Well, one, you know, one real obvious one, and, and sometimes with the, the information I give is very depressing. I'm actually very optimistic. You know, the number of full-time jobs that we have in America as a percent of adult population is the lowest it's been in 50 years. We don't really have full-time jobs. And, you know, both papers, the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, say, oh, there's 5 million jobs and, you know, for people. And I know, Terry, there are a lot of them that, 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 that we need to fill in and get $80,000 for. But there's a lot of facts that nobody wants to publish and nobody wants to hear. This is the most important one of all, I, I, I think, Glenn. We talk a lot about in cheerlead that 10 million jobs were added since the recession. Get a number in your mind. How many of them were part-time and temporary of the 10 million? Alan Kruger at Princeton went to work. It's 94%. So when the tide came in, what we washed out were millions and millions of middle-class jobs. Nobody talks about this, nobody wants to say it. Left is protect, protecting the, the administration, Wall Street is protecting the, 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 mar the market. And so that's really a very ugly picture. It, it gets a little uglier, I'm gonna pick this up. But those jobs come in only, from only one place and that's when new businesses start. New businesses, startups are the lowest they've been in 40 years. America has stopped building. There's no other side to that. When a company starts, that's where you can get a middle class job. The second one is in the first five years. If we were a cattle herd, you gotta have births, but the second thing is the cattle, you gotta fatten them in the first five years. So if I said, hey, how's the herd doing? We have fewer calves than the ones that are born aren't fattening, they're staying skinny. But until we fix that, I don't see how we can ever come back. And the way it plays out is if you take um, um, IPOs, three years ago there was 400 of them, the year before that there was 200, last year there was 100. You see how this all starts coming apart? You take the listed companies on NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange, 20 years ago there was 8,000 of them. What they're supposed to be right now is 12,000. What's it down to? We were 8,000, how many companies do we have now? Get a number in your head. The answer is 3,700. That's because big companies can't grow. When they show growth, it's because they have just given up on organics and they just acquire each other. So we don't really have growth. So when you say, hey, the, the, the S&P 500 grew, they're just buying each other. Kids coming out of MBA schools, the best thing that you can have if you want to get higher, and nobody's hiring them anyway, is they're just good at lean and Six Sigma. That's because they don't have any interest in growth. They just go in and cut them. I, okay, so that's the negative. The numbers are horrible. Millennials don't start companies. People my age did, all of us started companies. Millennials don't start companies. So if you said, How, do you think hell is coming in 20 years? I'd say yes, why? Because millennials don't start companies. Is it fixable? Yes. This is so important. The bad numbers coast to coast, there's huge variation by city. So if you wanna blame it on regulations or whatever. If you go to Memphis and Nashville, I always like that one because they're in the same country, so they have the same federal regulation, they're in the same state, so they have the same, same state regulations. Memphis has no new starts. They might as well just shut the lights off on the place. The, the thing's dead. If anybody's from Memphis, sorry. <laughs> but, if you, but if you drive up the road, if you drive up the road to Nashville, Nashville is absolutely booming. It's like you're, in two, it's like you're on two different planets. So 
it's not that America can't get, uh, um, I'm originally from Nebraska, I get a kick out of Sioux City and Sioux Falls. If you're, there you go, if you're a researcher, you love twins separated at birth. Sioux Falls and Sioux City are perfect twins separated at birth. Both on the Missouri River, and both, they kind of have the same name after Lakota Sioux. Sioux City is a horrible city. It's peep shows, nasty casinos. If you're from, if you're from Sioux City, sorry. But, um, <laughs> But if you just drive Memphis, right, Memphis and Sioux City are but, taking but it if, on the chin yeah, right now. I need to get it. I should get out of here fast. But, <laughs> but then if you drive up to Sioux Falls, Sioux Falls is absolutely exploding. But there's two different. I mean, it's a story. Uh, it's a tale of two different cities in this country. If we were all performing, like Austin, Nashville, um, whatever the other one is, I said, uh, I just mean we can we can turn this around. We just gotta. We just got to have the right models. That's a good pivot point, because what, what we've said, just to summarize a little bit, is while not 100% agreeing that, the, that we're in a full recovery, I think there's a general sense of the U.S. economy doing okay, um, and particularly in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, <laughs> there you uh, go. Yeah, well, so. Um, I hope you're all thinking about coming to Virginia. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> If you, want to put the new, if you want to put a new plant down, that's the place to put it. Um, by the way, I'm a native Virginian, so I'm doing just a little recruiting. Um, uh, that China continues to actually perform reasonably well. Um, and I think the data at Carlisle that we get would, would confirm that. That Europe, Europe economically is actually out of the ditch and, and uh, growing. Um, and, and so the global economy is not in a terrible place. Um, what we've also talked about is the fact that there, there is some geopolitical events around the world that can really impact um, our ability to access um, this growing economy. And finally, that we really need to compete. And this really at the core of what you're saying is it's time for us to compete, uh, to win. Um, and that allows me to jump off and talk about tax policy, um, just for a minute. Uh, and um, one of the... I, I think most talked about topics in these kinds of forums is what's coming from a tax policy standpoint. And recognizing that with the, with the legislative agenda that's, that's uh, on the docket, um, what it gets accomplished and what doesn't is still in question. But when we start talking about um, the kinds of uh, tax policy, particularly a, a border adjustment, um, and how that impacts um, actual companies. Um, Governor, when you look at, when you look at your state, uh, is, that a po is it positive for Virginia or is it negative for Virginia? Well, I'm very vocal. I think the border tax is one of the dumbest things I've ever heard because countries will retaliate against us immediately. Yeah. It goes to my argument earlier, we gotta quit sending this message to the globe that we in America don't wanna do trade with other countries. And it's such a vital part, it's about 200 and 50,000 jobs in Virginia are directly related to trade. This is a big opportunity, and it's been a huge growth for us. So I think the border tax is a very bad idea. We do need tax reform. I think one way to figure out is to get these major corporations that are overseas, repatriate that money back. I think we're all in agreement that should be done. But listen, this is a, you th if you thought health care was hard, and the president learned how tough health care was, yeah. this is much harder than that because everybody's got an oar in the water when it comes to tax reform. And it's gonna be very hard. Do we need tax reform in the country? Absolutely, should it be simpler? Should we incentivize businesses to keep their cash over here in America? Absolutely. But I don't wanna see it used as some type of trade war that we're putting walls up around uh, this country because that will not help us grow the economy. It is a global economy. I'll say it one more time. 95% of the world's customers live outside America. We're successful in Virginia because we go where the customers are. Right, 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 right. Jonathan, when you, when you look around the world and see um, tax policies that are different in every country, um, does, does it meaningfully impact the competitiveness of those countries, in your opinion? That's a really interesting question. I gotta be honest, I don't think we have a great answer, I mean, in terms of the fiscal and tax policies and how we, uh, and how that directly ties to the productivity again of the country, and that's how you'd measure it. So is this, product, is this country growing its productivity? What we can see is that countries that are growing their productivity faster are the ones that are more open to the governor's point. And so they're more literally in the flow, <laughs> and they get better uh, results. They get better people, they get better technology access, they get, better, they get more money. 
uh, and, uh, and they, they build that. So the, the winners are winning because they're ahead. And, they're, and so the, the tax policy has to be put in that context because you know, our you know, question, you know, what we have here is a situation where you've got an investment gap. I mean, we just, there has been a you know, dramatic decline across OECD of, of uh, including you know, primarily North America in fixed capital investment. Just people, and part of it's, you know, okay, companies are not putting the money into the country anymore. They're keeping it offshore. And if the, you fix the, fix the tax policy, that might happen. Another part of it is they're incentivized to uh, acquire each other uh, as opposed to invest in something. So, I mean, that, the, 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 there are aspects of tax policy which can really influence investment, which is ascent, incredibly essential if you want to get the rest of it going. And so the, uh, you know, the productivity growth and, and then the demand, which is the wages and the income. One thing that wasn't mentioned here is that real household incomes in uh, OECD for the last decade have been flat to declining for 60% of the population. 60, 70% of the population household income has been flat to declining. Uh, for the last decade. That's to your point about, about jobs. And so those, those middle class jobs disappeared. They were replaced by, low, by, by temporary jobs. The only reason it's been flat in most countries is because government has been able to keep it up through tax and transfers, whether it's Medicare or Medicaid or anything else. So the money is kind of getting spent in a way which isn't you know, going to the sustainability of growth. It isn't going into investments. It's kind of like keeping it all together at this point. So I think that's the real challenge. So how do you tweak the tax policy in a way which restarts that idea that we should be using this for investment, we should grow in it? Countries whose tax policy does reflect that, you know, which has a way of creating the accountability for those tax revenues and that, that tax being collected needs to be reinvested in investment and growth, they do better. Uh, they, uh, they, they, they grow faster. Okay. So Jack, given the client base that you work with, um, and given the uncertainty of tax legislation and what it's going to mean to them, are there any um, observations that you have of how they're either preparing or ignoring what might No, no, happen? they're all preparing. Yeah. Um, and I think expectations are probably too high. I mean, it's, I'm no expert on the stock market, but people are talking about how that's getting priced in. And I absolutely agree with the governor. Someone said to me last week, well, tax reform's a no-brainer because we've got agreement on a lot of issues. Well... I've never been around this town. I've been around for a while. We've never had a tax bill that was a no-brainer because everybody's got a, uh, an interest in it and they're extremely complex. So I think, but all of our clients are certainly very much preparing for it because it, and they're all hiring up, uh, hiring up in this town as they should. I think the big question seems to be whether or not um, they will go um, for a real comprehensive reform, um, which seems to be kind of where the speaker's been which I think is, is so much more difficult, or if they'll go with something you were talking about on repatriation tied to infrastructure, something that's, that's more narrowly defined. I think they're going to have, obviously, a much better shot if they go in that direction. Yeah, it's, it's, um, I, we've been doing it, trying to run scenarios for the kind of 250 companies that we're invested in, and it's impossible uh, because isolating the change is almost... Uh, beyond the ability of many CEOs to even say, you know, my cost base is here, my revenue base is here, my customers are there, and how do we reconcile all that? It's, it's, it's a but. I will say that it has um, uh, been a great exercise of understanding supply chains and the efficiency of supply chains and, and those kinds of things. And all it does is remind us all that the export work uh, that goes on and the import work and all the companies around uh, the world from a supply chain standpoint is incredibly complicated. Yeah, I, I think, you know, that, for example, on Brexit, and it's the same thing we'll go through on NAFTA if we start screwing around with that. I mean, our clients have such complex of supply chains that they're really, in, in our European clients, are trying to figure it out from that standpoint more than from the political standpoint or, or access to markets or so forth. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so um, I just want to kind of wrap things up a little bit. What I'd love to do um, is uh, f ask everyone just for a real quick assessment um, over, the, over the course of the next three to five years. Are you optimistic for the global economy? And what do you think is going to happen to the opportunity for businesses in the United States? You're looking at me. I'm starting with you, Jim. <clears throat> I am. I think that I think that some of our assumptions are wrong. I think that 
leaders in cities have to, I mean, I think that they have to figure out how they can have new business, like they're hoeing rattlesnakes, or, or I think it's very difficult to see a future. We've got to have real organic growth in the United States and companies that start up, and I really agree with you, Governor, if we don't export, we are so screwed. You know, we're 25% of all the money in the world. There's going to be about $100 trillion, 150 over the next 25 years of just coming in. Are we going to have 25% of that or not? If we're going to have 12% of it, we have a very different relationship uh, with the whole world. We are very good at innovation, and most leaders think that innovation creates jobs. It creates zero jobs because innovation doesn't have any value until a customer is standing next to it. We've made innovation very intentional. We've put hundreds of billions of dollars into it. When you ask a question about where does a business come from, an entrepreneur, and you say, is it born or is it developed? You're 50-50 here at best because we can't even agree on that. That's how little we know about what real builders are like. But I think as soon as we get that figured out and get early identification of rare builders with, with, with very intentional development, I think we can rewind the world. And, and this is very American to say, and I mean it clinically and technically, but the world works better when we dominate it economically. Jonathan? Um, yeah, again, where you, I think what you see depends on what you, where you sit. And, Back to uh, where we started. Right. So uh, I'm, a, but I'm an optimist, and uh, I don't see how anybody who's living in China and Asia for the last 30 years could be anything but an optimist. Yeah. And you've seen, you know, literally the single biggest improvement in the human condition in the history of mankind uh, in the shortest period of time. Hundreds of millions of people, billions of people lifted out of poverty, entire economies created overnight, and now a wave of technology innovation, which is going to reshape the entire world. I mean, one can't be other, anything other than excited about the opportunity that the global economy has. And equally so, as Governor is saying, and, and totally, there are companies and there are places which, in the United States which can and should and will uh, participate in it, but it doesn't happen by itself. It doesn't happen by itself. And we have institutional barriers, be they tax, be they, be they policy, uh, be they uh, consumption inequalities that need to be addressed to make it happen. So I am incredibly optimistic, but you know, this is going to have to take, this is going to take some work. And I just hope that people sort of see the prize now, see the prize. So that's, that's the opportunity. If we see the prize, we can get it. <laughs> that's great. Jack? Well, I'm optimistic, too. Um, but um, for all those reasons, I think we, I, I mean, uh, today, would you rather live today than 50 years ago? Would you rather live today than 10 years ago? Probably, I, I think we all, most of us would. That said, and not to be uh, a downer in this conversation, you know, the, the free flow of capital and the accumulation of wealth is dependent on billions of people thinking that they are going to get a fair shot at it. And if those billions of people don't think they're going to get a fair shot of it, what appears to be what's happening and what's behind the rise of populism and nationalism and a, and a dysfunctional po politic, um, then we have serious problems because I don't think you can have long-term growth without those people buying into it and without free markets. And, and, and we have to address that issue, it seems to me, if we're gonna continue the fabulous kind of progress that we've seen over the last 50 years. That's great. Governor? I'm the eternal optimist, I, like everybody else. But there, I mean, there are some things we should be very concerned about. The federal government today, uh, the Congress is broken. Nobody can get together and get anything done. I have never seen a more divided Congress than we have today. There is no working together. We can, you know, big international policies have to come out of the Congress uh, for the president to sign. It is totally broken today. The partisanship is so bad for us to compete on a global basis. They've got to learn to be able to work together. I do it as a governor every day, as I say. I'm a, I'm a very fiscally conservative, pro-business Democrat, socially progressive. I have a Tea Party legislature, but we come together on economic development and education. You got to be able to work together. I mean, look at XM. You, I mean the disgrace that's gone through about funding the Export-Import Bank. It creates jobs and it makes money. What is wrong with that? I don't know. But the Congress, can't <laughs> the Congress cannot come together. And this is what the, the big dark cloud out there, are they up to the challenge of making us competitive on a global basis? They got to change the way they do business. What just happened with the Senate yesterday, I think is going to divide people even more, unfortunately. So, you know, hopefully we, People can get together. Let me just say finally, two seconds. 
I'm here. All the governors get invited. I'm the governor that keeps coming every year. I want you to know, forget those other 49 states. <laughs> they, ha they have dissed you. Virginia is here because we love you. Just remember, very pro-growth, low-tax, business-friendly state. I got mountains. I got the ocean. Great education. Yeah. Great, Great education. education. I, I don't have sharks in my water. You come to Virginia Beach, dolphins come up. They pick up your children. They give them rod. <laughs> I got 297 wineries, 181 craft breweries, eight varieties of oysters. You eat our oysters, you drink our wine. Ah, Virginia's for lovers. You figure out the rest, but come on. You know, I was going to try to finish up with something, but I'm going to stop right here. <laughs> Thank you all for having us, and have a great day. Good to see you. Great to see you. Hey, my son is at the UVA Law. After four years.